Hi there, thanks for joining me. So, um, the cat is sitting on the couch here next to me. <laughs> uh, we're going to do another pickups video here. Um, I've slowed down a little bit. I still, you know, I'm lacking in any self-control. <laughs> but uh, I am comforted by the fact that this is a finite prospect, right? Like, uh, I have a list and eventually, like, I, you know, will be done with the list. Um, I am visiting stores and kind of like just picking up some games that are, you know, available. Um, but that's not going to be, you know, a, a thing that carries on indefinitely into the future. So mostly this is PlayStation 4 games. Um, there are some games for uh, another system um, and some movies and things like that. So let's get started. Um, for starters, we have... Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon and DVD. I think I mentioned to you guys I'm pretty much finished collecting Pokemon. Uh, the last thing I have left is Sun and Moon Ultra Legends. Um, they did kind of reboot the series after this and I'm going to stop uh, getting the TV series. But this is literally the end, I believe, of whatever this is, Sun and Moon. So the last 18 episodes. Um, there are two other DVD sets. I don't know why they decided to break this out into three sets aside from, you know, maybe they can charge more money for it. Um, I just haven't gotten the previous two sets to this. So I will pick those up and finish this off sometime in the next couple of months probably, and then I'll be done with that. Um, I also found, used for 13 bucks, uh, Ant-Man on Blu-ray. Um, I've, you might have noticed I've been getting like some Marvel Cinematic Universe movies when I find them, you know, used and things like that. Um, I've seen them all in the theater, so I feel like I've kind of, you know, paid my dues, so to speak, uh, in that respect. Um, and, you know, ones that I want to re-watch, and I think I pretty much want to re-watch them all because I do enjoy, uh, these movies for what they are. Um, yeah, I've been picking up used when I find them, so, uh, so I grabbed this. Um, Ant-Man is one of those ones where, like, I feel like it might rate a little lower on my list, um, you know, compared to some of the other... Uh, Marvel movies. Uh, the thing I remember the most is I think I fell asleep during <laughs> during this. Um, I don't want to pin that too much on the movie though. Uh, I, I just I went to see the movie when I was extremely tired and so I just like fell asleep in the theater. So um, I've kind of seen highlights of this film since then because I've watched some people react to it on YouTube. But I do kind of need to like rewatch it from the beginning just to like get everything from the movie because I definitely missed some stuff so I wanted to pick it up when I saw it. Uh, I will rewatch that sometime soon probably. Um, so next up uh, a couple of games that I got um, at stores, at GameStops. Uh, I stopped by a couple of GameStops again when I was out and I found this um, what is this? World of Final Fantasy. Um, this was also released on the Vita, um, but I saw it here for PS4. It was something in the range of like 10 to 15 bucks. Um, I think it was more like it was probably 15 bucks, but I think I might have gotten a couple bucks off because I'm a GameStop Rewards member or something, and I might have had a coupon. You know, I don't really remember. Um, but anyway, uh, it was it was quite affordable, and I was like, oh yeah, I wanted to check that game out. Uh, it seems like. Um, I don't think, I think it's a turn-based RPG, but it's kind of like a Final Fantasy fan game, right? It almost seems like a, um, you know, a little bit of a Kingdom Hearts-ish thing. I don't know that the gameplay or the, or the staff or anything like that are very similar, but I just, you know, you kind of have these, like, a couple of human characters that are sort of thrown into, like, this Final Fantasy universe where it's, like, all kinds of Final Fantasy characters and storylines are intertwined. Um, and it just seemed pretty cool. It was just something that I never picked up on the Vita, like when it had first come out, or the PS4, and I just saw this used, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll grab that for, you know, whatever, less than 15 bucks. Um, next up, a, another $15 game. Um, this, I think, was new and actually on clearance. Um, this is the uh, Mega Man Zero and ZX Legacy Collection. Now, I had to double check on this because I was like, wait a minute, do I have this already? But I was thinking back and I was like, those PlayStation 2 collections are uh, Mega Man, um, kind of the OG Mega Man games, and then Mega Man X was the thing. So I was like, okay. So these are, I guess, games that were on the Game Boy Advance, I want to say. 
Um, so definitely nothing that I played. And it has Mega Man 0, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, ZX, and ZX Advent. So I was like, you know what? That's pretty cool. I don't love the Mega Man games, but I like them. I definitely played a bunch of Mega Man 2 on the original NES. Anyway, this seems like a cool collection of Mega Man games I've never played, so I want to check that out. Um, so yeah, so now what we're getting into are... I was saying on the PlayStation 4, I wanted to go after games that are maybe a little bit more purposeful about, right? I'm like, these are games that I am seeking out, not just things that I'm finding at GameStop and they're, you know, affordable and I want to take a chance on them because they're 10 or 15 or $20. So I'm um, still, you know, we're actually kind of going by price range here as well, so I'm um, starting with $20 games and then we're going to go up to some, some higher uh, priced games. Um, I did pick this up for 20 bucks. I think, on eBay or something like that, uh, Will a Wonderful World. And, you know, again, nothing against, um, you know, the developer or publisher uh, of this. Um, I may have sought this out at a higher price. It's just, you know, game. some of these games are cheap right now, and I just I wasn't looking for this when it had first come out. But uh, when I looked into it, it seemed like a cool game. It's, uh, I believe, is a narrative uh, adventure-style game where uh, you're basically... Uh, it sounds like it it's kind of a more wholesome version of Death Note, let's say, where uh, you find a like a kind of a mystical notebook. <clears throat> but instead of it allowing you to kill people, it uh, allows you to like kind of grant your wishes, right? Sort of sort of make your uh, alter your fate or something like that. So you can you can offer up a wish to the gods via this notebook and like it will it will change the course of your life. So um, it seems, I don't think that it's a super dark sort of story, and I guess I'm not entirely sure, um, but it seems like more of a mystery, I don't know, just a, like an interesting adventure game, right? So I wanted to check that out. Seems, seems cool. This I picked up on eBay because it was cheap. Uh, again, apologies, you know, it's just, that's what I did. So, um, Date Alive, Rio Reincarnation. Now, I have to say what I'm probably most interested in about this in particular is the character designs are done by uh, Tsunako, who did the character designs for the Neptunia series. So, um, you know, right off the bat, I like the character designs. They're very cute, they're very good. Like, her style is really cool. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, there's like a lot of characters in this too. Um, I don't know exactly how this originated. Let's see. Shido Itsuka lived an average life until a dangerous encounter with a spirit unlocked a new ability. Now he's on a mission to save the world from destruction and perhaps even save the spirits themselves. All he has to do is seal away their powers with a kiss. Well, oh, isn't that sweet? All right. Uh, with spirits, those who hunt them, and shifting realities at every turn, what could possibly go wrong in this romantic visual novel? Okay. So it is really like just strictly a narrative. Uh, based game, which which sounds great. So, um, you know, I do kind of want to catch up on the story. I will probably research exactly where this picks up in the story. If I need to watch an anime first, I'll probably check that out. Um, but I'm interested in, you know, just seeing what the story is like, because obviously I really like the Neptunia series. I don't know if it shares anything else in common with Neptunia other than the character designer, but I am at least curious to see what, you know, the story entails. Um, so next up, I did make an order directly from Idea Factory so store in particular. Um, they are having a sale, or at least they were at the time that I ordered this, which was not long ago, maybe like within the past week or two. Um, Arc of Alchemist. Um, what I've looked up on this, it seems like it has mixed reviews. Um, some people seem to like it, other people don't. They do have this on sale on their, you know, their main site completely sealed for 20 bucks, so I don't know if that's indicative of anything, but certainly it's the right price to pick up a game with mixed reviews that you know I may or may not get into. Um, it looks like an action RPG. Uh, it has kind of cute, you know, uh, characters. They look sort of, they're not quite 
they're kind of chibi characters, I guess, but they're more in the style of Radiata stories. Kind of reminds me of the character designs from that. Um, at any rate, uh, for 20 bucks, I felt like that was, you know, it was worth picking up. Next up, I grabbed Root Letter. Uh, this is something that I mentioned in my previous videos that I was interested in getting. Um, this has kind of been on my radar. It does have a sequel. It seems like an interesting, like, mystery adventure game, right? Investigate the tragedy of a young girl using letters 15 years from the past. It's even it's even says on it a Katakawa games mystery. So um, you're you're going around, you're investigating, like you're literally interviewing people, basically trying to find out what happened to this girl. Uh, as far as I know, this is fairly well regarded. Um, so I've kind of wanted to just see, you know, hey, what what's this all about? Because I find these sort of um, you know adventure narrative style games are pretty interesting. Sometimes they have really good stories. Uh, I really like that they're being localized a lot more now, so I definitely want to see what uh, Root Letter has going for it, uh, especially to see if I'd like to play the sequel uh, to it as well. Uh, next up we have my one and only PlayStation Portable game this time. This is uh, Valhalla Nights 2. Uh, you guys may remember in my previous video I picked up Valhalla Nights 1. I do have Valhalla Nights 3 for the Vita, which I very much enjoyed. And uh, I've wanted to get the rest of the games in the series. There is also a game on the Wii which I have, which I have not played. Uh, but I am pretty interested in playing the first and second games. Um, so I picked it up. This one, um, so all of these games previously have been like 20, 20, you know, in the range of twenty dollars or so, um, this was a little bit more. This is getting a little closer to thirty bucks with shipping, right? Um, it wasn't. It wasn't thirty bucks. It was a little less, but it was. It was getting a little more up there. Um, but I think that that was worth it for you know a PSP game that I'm. I'm I feel like I'm pretty much guaranteed to like. Right? Uh, it is a used game, but um, you know I'm glad to be able to have picked it up affordably and. Um, I just really like these games. I think I think I'm going to enjoy that a lot. Uh, next up, so this was a little bit. I was a little hesitant to, to grab this necessarily. Uh, I think it was a great deal, and uh, I was definitely willing to spend uh, the price that I paid for this. It was thirty bucks on Idea Factory International's uh, official site. Uh, it was on sale, and I think that you know I think that was was fine. The main thing that was holding me back was I had seen this quite a lot. I think a few years ago at GameStops, right? It was it was pretty readily available, they had it new, they had it used, and I think in hitting up GameStops recently and getting like some of these especially good deals on games, I just assumed I was going to run into a copy of Dark Rose Valkyrie, right? Like I didn't figure it would have just disappeared from the store shelves in the ensuing like couple of years, right? But um, I've, you know, I've visited a number of local GameStops uh, repeatedly over the past you know, month or so, and definitely had not seen Dark Rose Valkyrie pop up at all. So the, I guess, danger, right, is that I'm going to run into this in a GameStop for like 15 bucks at some point and be like, oh wow, I wasted like 15 bucks, right, you know? So this uh, is the staff from, uh, some of the staff from the Tales of games, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's an action RPG, right? Uh, the Tales of games are action RPGs. Uh, this, I believe, is similar. And it also, or, oh yeah, it does have a similar kind of mystery style gameplay to it too. So um, there is actually a traitor, like I guess there's some disease, you know, it's some alternate future, right? There's some disease that's going around and it's turning people into monsters, basically. So, um, but part of what you're doing is trying to uncover this mystery of like someone is a traitor in your organization and you're trying to find out who uh, or whom. So, um, I think that sounds cool, right? I think that, you know, reviews, I mean, like, they weren't, like, necessarily all glowing, but people people seem to like this game quite well, so, um, I've been wanting to get it for, for years now, so I'm glad that I have that. Um, next we have, uh, Azure Lane Crosswave. I would say Azure, but it's actually A-Z-U-R. This is, uh, was originally a mobile game, and I actually played the mobile game. I didn't play it for very long, I just downloaded it to check it out a year or two ago, um, before I started playing Marvel Strike Force, which is kind of the mobile game that I'm still playing right now. Um, but, yeah, anyway, um, you know, Ship Girls were a big thing. I think it was Kantai Collection, right, that was a big deal a while ago. I watched the anime for that. I did enjoy it. Um, there is, you know, a little bit of hesitancy 
for me when I'm like, hmm, is this really like kind of glorifying nationalism and militarism and things like that? But I think it's okay to like kind of separate to a certain extent, like enjoying media from like, I don't know, you know, your politics and, and things like that, unless things are like super overt, right? So um, I'm like, you know, I think we can enjoy ship girls and not have to worry too much about, um, you know, sort of the, the, the real you know, the real world implications of, of like, you know, uh, mil militaries and militarism and nationalism and things like that. Um, it seems like it's just cute and that's, that's fine. So, um, so anyway, um, this, the mobile game seemed like it played kind of like a shooter. We're like a little ship girl on the screen and shooting at other ships, like blowing up their guns and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, you're also, you're playing it on a, a mobile phone screen and stuff. And I, I, I didn't decide that I wanted to keep playing it, but just the fact that there's a PlayStation 4 game, um, you know, it intrigues me. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that that doesn't mean that this is riddled with like free to play monetization elements and things like that. I kind of hope that they just um, kind of packaged this into a more like console game um, single payment experience, right? Where you're just going to buy this and you're going to be able to play it for 20 or 30 or 40 hours and have some fun with it. So uh, it sounds like there's an adventure sort of narrative portion to it, I guess. And then you do have those um, like sort of ship battles where you're shooting stuff. I don't know if you're like collecting you know, ship girls and things like that. I assume, I assume some of that sort of stuff, but I don't know a ton about it. Um, I just want to check it out. It seems pretty cool. I thought it was worth uh, 30 bucks. Uh, next up, uh, we have Disaster Report for Summer Memories. Uh, I had mentioned this previously. Um, you guys know that I had been kind of on the lookout for this, and I realized, like, it seems that, you know, um, Nipponichi uh, America, um, may not have made a ton of these. Um, I don't know exactly through which channels it was available to purchase and things like that. Um, it does seem like you could get it quite affordably through GameStop if, like, let's say you ran across a used copy. Um, I think that they listed it on their website. It was like 15 bucks or something like that, which is, you know, a great price point. But uh, I ended up picking this up off of, I think, Amazon, um, just because they had a copy that was definitely the, um, you know, the, 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 right region, the, the Nipponichi um, America version, and it was like 40 bucks, and I was like, you know what, um, I, I'd like this game enough that I'm willing to just spend 40 bucks on it, that's actually, it's a really good deal, right, it's not, it's not full price uh, for a new game, um, that's, that's great, right, I'm, I'm willing to, to spend that on this. Um, I think that, be, like, sometimes series of games will become kind of legendary. I think we might have gotten one other of these games localized on, like, the PlayStation 2 or something like that. All I know is that, like, it it's cultivated some status, right, because of its obscurity, and, and it seems like its creativity, too. Like, it seems like a relatively well-regarded, uh, interesting um, series of games for probably a certain kind of gamer, right? Like, for me, Personally, I dearly love Ill Bleed, right? And that that also I feel like has developed somewhat of a legendary status as time has gone by, as more people have realized, oh, this is a super quirky, really interesting, uh, exceptionally good game for the right person, right? But um, that doesn't mean it's the right game for every person. Um, there's a reason why some of these games aren't just generally popular. So I feel like... Uh, some people have been a bit disappointed in this game in particular. I don't know if I will like this or not. Uh, I feel like it was worth $40 to find out, um, and I felt like that was that was a good deal, uh, and I'm looking forward to checking it out. So that's why I got that. Uh, and next up, so this is something that I probably took the most chance on and spent the most money on. This still was not a full price game, sealed and new, right? Um, I did not get this directly from Idea Factory either. They're actually out of stock on it on their store. And that's one of the reasons why I was like, hmm, maybe I should prioritize this in particular, Death End Request. Um, all I really know about this game is just, you know, some of the things I've looked into about it. Um, uh, clearly it's published by Idea Factory and uh, I guess ostensibly developed by Compiler. The impression that I get from the gameplay that I've looked at from this is that it looks very similar to um, the Neptunia games, right? Kind of the traditional mainline Neptunia RPGs. They're turn-based RPGs 
Um, they have kind of actionish elements to them. But what I've read is that um, you know this has a like sort of a big adventure kind of narrative component to it, uh, and it has kind of like. RPG turn-based battles, but it even says on the back, it's like, shift battles from turn-based to fighters, shooters, and more. So there seems to be some kind of, like, shuffling of game genres going on in this. Um, it seems like maybe a little bit avant-garde in that respect. Um, it says, crack the code to unlock skills, log out to uncover mysteries in the real world. And I don't think they mean the, our real world, right? I think they mean in the game. You're maybe playing some kind of a, you know, MMO or something like that, and then you're able to log out and then in the game, like, uncover, you know, more mysteries in, like, a, an in-game real world. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't know a, a whole lot. But it says, trapped between reality and the virtual world, what really happens when it's game over? Question mark, right? So, um, it seems interesting. Uh, I only spent 50 bucks on this, um, so it was still, I didn't, I didn't spend full price on it, right? Um, I picked this up off eBay, I think, and, uh, and there's a sequel to it. That was the other thing, I think, that really spurred me on, is I'm like, oh, okay, um, this game has a sequel, and if I'm ever going to play the sequel, I really should get this. It's out of stock on Idea Factory store, um, you know, it's less than full price, um, there's a sequel, and I think I might want to play it. Plus, it sounds pretty unique and interesting, so um, uh, I grabbed this. Uh, it also seems like it's generally like favorably reviewed, right? So um, this seems like a pretty, pretty great game. I don't know. I haven't played it, right? But um, anyway, it's my final pickup of my huge stack <laughs> of PlayStation 4 games that I obviously cannot. Uh, I have to throw out the window the idea that I think I posited, you know four or five videos ago where I was saying, hey, like, this might just be a collection where I play a few games in my collection and then allow myself to go purchase some more games. No, I'm, I'm just buying the games. Um, that's okay. I, I did play um, a game, however. I'm feeling much more normal, right, these days. Uh, more cheerful, less depressed, less sullen, less um, unmotivated, and things like that. I, I was in a pretty bad space for quite a while. So um, I'm able to enjoy gaming, which is fabulous. I missed it so much. Um, at any rate, uh, I've been playing Dragon Quest XI, and boy was that game fun. I finished the game. Um, there is a lot of post-game content and a lot of trophies and things like that that I hadn't gotten. I've gotten about 50% of the trophies on the game, but I did reach the official conclusion, right, um, beyond which you can play. Um, and I think I'm going to call it quits there for now, especially because there are so many other games that I have that I would like to play for my PlayStation 4. Uh, I chose an extremely long game. Dragon Quest XI took me a hundred, about close to 106 hours to finish um, to the point that I finished it. You could play it, I'm sure, for, for much longer. Uh, I don't think you could play it for much shorter. You, you know, could probably have finished it up in 100 hours, maybe a little less, but um, it's, it's a long game, and that's fine. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think that my main takeaways from Dragon Quest XI are that, um, I mean, I want to say it was, it was nearly a perfect experience for me. I think a lot of that is colored by a certain amount of nostalgia. Um, I feel like if you were coming at the game fresh, right, without necessarily having experience with other, like, 8-bit uh, and 16-bit RPGs necessarily, um, you know, you may not have had quite as positive an experience as I did. I think it's still a great game that, that you know, probably just about anyone who likes RPGs at any rate would enjoy. Um, but it does, it, it has this spirit of staying so true to its roots while still, you know, evolving somewhat as a, as a game series that, um, like, I, it just, it struck this perfect balance, I think. Um, that just, it worked for me very, very well. And, um, you know, the dungeons weren't complex, right? They were kind of just right. Um, the, like, the leveling stuff wasn't, um, 
super involved, the combat wasn't super crazy, but it was kind of just right, right, you know? Um, so many things about it, and even narratively, like the story hit me a few times where I was like, oh wow, you know? Uh, some of it's a little cliched, but it's not ter terribly cliched. Um, but it's it's comfortable, right? You know, I'm like, oh, this is like one of those hero stories. You're fighting against the big bad villain. You know, you're you're using the sword of light to uh, to vanquish the evil, and you know, you have this axe structure where like the you know the hero gets knocked down a peg and then they get back up again, and you know, but they don't. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of like playing with your expectations and things like that. It was more like meeting your expectations, right? Or exceeding your expectations just in, um, you know, making things uh, uh, kind of refreshingly not complicated, right? Refreshingly not convention-defying. Um, they were, they were, uh, it, it was very much just uh, a, a wonderful, wholesome, uh, actually, every th uh, a lot of tragedy actually in the game. It was there was a lot of really sad stuff happened, but it was presented in such a kind of a fun, positive, uh, cheerful way too. That you know maybe that was just something that I I needed right now too. Just expect a really solid game. I like anybody that went into that expecting like an RPG, right? Um, I which would not be disappointed, I don't think. I don't think they would come away with anything less than being like, you know, well, maybe I had some issues with this and this and that, but it was a really solid game that was enjoyable to play. Um, for me, personally, I think it was a step above that. Um, it, was, it, was, it was very fun, and I really liked it, so for what that's worth. Um, there are some interesting things that have been going on. Um, what was it? That, that one game... Um, a sealed N64 game, it's like Mario 64 or something, that sold for like $1.5 million or something like that. Um, completely ridiculous, right? Uh, but I actually read a pretty interesting Ars Technica article about it that um, shed some light on that for me um, and made it make a little more sense. It, it was interesting. I think the main point that they were making was that, um, you know, th there's there's been a certain kind of collector that's collected games up until now, right? The, the main point they were making is that a lot of these collectors were collecting complete sets, right? Um, they, they'll have a, a game system that they're really nostalgic for, and they want, like, every NES game that was ever really pu published or released in, in a certain area or, or, or globally or, you know, whatever it is you're collecting, right? And, um, you know, I have a complete U.S., like, North American Dreamcast collection. I have a complete um, Atari 7800 collection. Uh, I have a complete PCFX collection, right? Um, so, you know, I've, I've done that kind of collecting before. And, and so the games that end up being expensive in that type of collecting are games that are, um, you know needed for a complete collection. Maybe they're, they were kind of rare, they had a limited print run, and people didn't like it. It could, it could be anything random. It could be a sports game, right? I mean, it usually isn't, but, like, there could be sports games that are super collectible. I mean, what was it? Uh, uh, stadium events, right? That's, that's kind of a sports game. But this is different, right? And um, so part of that is I feel like these complete collectors are have been doing their thing, but there's there's new collectors coming in. At least this this article is implying that. Um, and I think some of that has to do with they were saying like there's this particular auction site or location or something like that. This place where you can d deal in collectibles, and they have a lot of you know these slabbed in these acrylic slabs and these graded like I kind of hate seeing that, but. Like, they have that for, like, baseball cards and comic books and things like that. And those have been collectible for a long time, and that those sort of um, people collecting that, like, it's kind of evolved. And, like, people with real money, right, like, like money money, uh, have kind of been collecting in those circles. Um, and I think that, that this particular auction place... Um, has started dealing in video games just recently, right? So that, in a way, is introducing video game collecting into this kind of established collectibles market that has a lot more money in it than I think the market that that you know collectors like myself have have you know been in 
And then, you know, additionally, I think that's just the idea of collecting sealed games, right? Um, it seems ludicrous to a certain extent to me as the kind of collector that I am, and I think the kind of collectors that most people, uh, you know, have been. But to, I think, these, these collectors that have been collecting baseball cards and comic books and things like that, I think that they're okay with the idea of collecting a comic book they're not going to read and a baseball card that, I don't know what, they're not going to trade with their friends. I mean, what do you do with baseball cards? Like, you know, you just used to collect them when you were a kid, right? But um, some of them, I think, have value now. A lot of it is because of their condition. So that's a big thing, I think, what we're finding with these um, unopened games is condition is a criteria by which um, video games have not been traded very much, right? Um, but when you're looking at it from that perspective, that weird sale of that N64 game makes a little bit more sense, right? Um, you know, Mario 64 is a common game, but how many copies of it are sealed and in extremely good condition now? Right. However, however, 20 years later, 25 years later, I don't know. It's been a, it's been quite a while. Um, probably not that many. Right. Um, maybe you're dealing with 10 or 20 or something. Um, and you know, from that perspective, maybe spending whatever it was a million and a half dollars on that makes a little more sense. Right. And once I read that, I was kind of like, oh. Do I have any sealed games? <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I'm not above the idea of, of making money off of a video game if um, I can, right? You know what I'm saying? You know, unfortunately, I, I, like, I have a couple games even just for like something like the PlayStation 3, right? Because I was, I was kind of collecting, you know, you guys watched my videos um, for the PlayStation 3 when it was in the same situation as the PS4. And, um, you know, some of those games I got new and I didn't play, but I opened them. Right, and I was like, "Oh man!" Because if I, I feel like me, hey, maybe if I kept one or two of those sealed, um, maybe I put them in a, one of those acrylic slabs right now. <laughs> just, just saying. Um, but anyway, you know, uh, it crossed my mind. I do have a couple sealed games. Um, I might keep my eye on them and see if I still have them in good shape, and if you know, I don't know, I want to get them graded or something. But it's certainly nothing I want to like get involved in like right like and especially like buying and trading in those games um it's it's a it's a game for for big money collectors right it's it's not i think we're all all the all the collectors you know are kind of feeling like collecting is less fun now um and in a way it is you know it's just it's changed and it's different uh, i just wanted to kind of share that with you guys because it uh it shed a little bit more light on what was going on to me and I feel like just um, you know understanding something that can seem really perplexing especially in a space that you feel like you um, have a, like some sort of minor amount of expertise in um, it, it, it can it can be disconcerting right it, it doesn't feel good so um, I just thought I'd share that with you guys in case that helped you I'll, I'll link the Ars Technica article in the description so you guys can read that but um, Anyway, I may split this off into its own video as just a little vlog uh, where I talk about a couple things. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, I hope that you enjoyed my uh, pickups here, a lot of PlayStation 4 games that I got. And um, I hope you'll join me again for more video game and anime related videos. Uh, take care, guys.